All right, good evening. My name is uh, Dr. Gary Wright. I'm an anesthesiologist here at Exeter Hospital. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about um, uh, regional anesthesia, uh, epidural anesthesia, and analgesia, and also uh, talk about cesarean delivery. Because about one out of three of you in this room is going to have a surgical delivery. And that's kind of playing national averages right now, uh, which are somewhere in the neighborhood of about 34%. So um, we have to be prepared for anything that goes on. But first, I want to reassure you that this lecture that we're giving tonight, this discussion, is a very informal one, one that will allow you to interact with us and answer whatever questions you might have. Uh, this is also um, a time for you to feel comfortable with the fact that you know, we respect the fact that everybody comes with a different type of uh, labor plan, uh, that this is not guiding any one individual to a particular type of uh, pain control but that uh, we, we recognize the uniqueness of each delivery and labor and uh, respect the fact that some patients uh, desire no medication whatsoever. Some require just uh, some IV narcotic medication. Some would desire uh, regional anesthesia for pain control um, and the, some of the other options that we'll talk about tonight. Um, but it is a unique thing just because pain is a unique aspect and it's a very, uh, uh, subjective kind of an, of an issue for individuals. Um, what is uncomfortable and painful for one individual might not be for another. Uh, so we're going to take that into account tonight, talk a little bit about the difference between anesthesia and analgesia. We'll talk a little bit about the options that we have here and what your expectations could be as being a patient here at, uh, at Exeter. So we'll get started. Um, I try to walk around a lot and, and not stand behind a podium, but I, I do have to fire slides here occasionally. So here's a little bit of epidural humor. I reckon I'm an epidural at least until they're you know, off to school. Um, we'll talk a little bit about analgesia first. Um, it's simply stated, it's the absence of pain uh, and the sensation of pain. The difference is that when we talk about anesthesia, we're talking about the complete absence of sensation. So many of you have been to the dentist's office. You've, you've had local anesthetics that have given to you and created completely um, uh, a desensit uh, type of a situation where there is no sensation at all. Um, and that is usually used with the use of, of local anesthetics. Analgesia, on the other hand, can be a reduction or elimination of the sensation of pain that can occur from anywhere from the use of non-narcotic forms of pain control to narcotic forms of pain control and also uh, the use of local anesthetics. So uh, thanks to August Beer, uh, who was a researcher and a physician uh, who was attempting to place um, a, uh, a spinal anesthetic in a dog with the use of cocaine, uh, we now have regional anesthesia that we can use for labor because in his uh, lack of success, he determined that he could place local anesthetic into a space called the epidural space and provide hindquarter anesthesia for the animal. Uh, so therefore, um, we are now blessed with this technique that uh, has been in practice uh, routinely uh, since the, the late 40s, early 50s. And anesthesia providers um, and our patients are the beneficiaries of this innovation. And fortunately, it's not a novel technique anymore, and it's routine to our practice of anesthesia here. So what, the, what are the options that you uh, have if you're in pain? Well, there are certain uh, non-pharmacologic ways we can support you with breathing techniques, emotional support. Um, there's birthing balls, massage, hypnobirthing. Um, there are baths that are used, um, uh, tubs that are used for whirlpool. There are other things that can be given in terms of analgesics, such as intravenous treatment, such as Stadol, which is a narcotic that we use here. Uh, it's an ultra-short-acting medication, which is fairly safe in the use of, of obstetrical anesthesia. And also, we can go to other realms of analgesics, such as inhaled therapies like nitrous oxide, which uh, we use here to be in a self-administered type of way. Uh, there's a small training that you receive, and then uh, nitrous is given um, as, as an analgesic. It is a potent analgesic, but it is a very short-acting one. Uh, you stop breathing it, and the pain returns very quickly. The gold standard of uh, the reduction of pain in labor would uh, be epidural analgesia. Uh, this can be only performed by uh, an anesthesiologist or a certified registered nurse anesthetist or a CRNA. So we'll review a little bit about uh, the, the stages of labor. There are three such stages. The first one is uterine contraction, uh, and, and this is from the beginning of the onset of uh, a periodic uh, contraction to cervical dilation of 10 centimeters. 
And this can be a variable period of time. This can last several hours, sometimes up to a day. Um, and this is a stage where epidural analgesia is uh, highly effective. So what we're trying to do when we are um, administering local anesthetics in an epidural is to target those nerves in the lumbosacral region uh, that innervate uh, the lower pelvis and the abdomen. And this is where the majority of pain will begin. Uh, usually women will complain of back pain or high abdominal labor pain. And then as the baby uh, engages the birth canal and descends, uh, there'll be more perineal pain, there'll be more vaginal discomfort, more rectal discomfort. So those are more in the lower sacral nerve roots. So we're, we're tending to fire um, uh, local anesthetics in the area of the lumbar, uh, uh, mid-lumbar area, and then eventually we'll um, provide analgesia in the lower sacral uh, nerve roots. These are those that are targeted, um, but oftentimes uh, when we get to the latest stages of labor and we're actually into the second stage where we're delivering the baby, uh, they will be, uh, begin to become ineffective. So epidural and spinals uh, must pass through several layers of tissues when we're administering them. And um, uh, these layers have characteristics feel to your anesthetic provider. So uh, it's by a tactile sensation that we actually know where we're placing the medication and uh, what the course of, of the needle will be. Uh, we try to tend to place you in a, in a maximally flex position. Um, I usually will bring um, the patient into kind of a sitting uh, position with um, them punched over uh, in, on the end of the bed, the legs separated as much as possible so we can bring the baby down between your legs, um, give you a pillow to tuck underneath your chin, and essentially relax your shoulders and arch yourself as much as you possibly can into a flex position so we can open up the spinous processes and we can administer the medication uh, more readily and more successfully. Now we try to time this in between a contraction so that you're not having pain while we're actually in the, in the middle of the procedure. Uh, I can usually place an epidural within about three to four minutes. You're usually having contractions about two to three minutes. So we kind of wait for a contraction to happen while you're prepped and draped and then go to, go to work at placing an epidural in between. Um, majority of the time we're very successful at, at placing one during that period of time. So you don't need to fear that you're going to move or you're going to disturb the placement of an epidural. We recognize that you're going to be uncomfortable in a very cyclic way, okay? So um, posture and positioning is critical. Dads can help um, and participate in this uh, process. Uh, if dads want to be really close, I'll usually have them wear a mask. This is a sterile procedure that we're doing, so it's important for um, uh, everybody to kind of, you know, be on board with that when we're going to do it. Some dads don't want to be around. They don't want to see a needle. They don't want to see anything that's done. That's fine. You can go grab a cup of coffee, and, you know, we're perfectly good with that. Um, so this is the typical position that we would um, place you in for this procedure with you kind of arched over. Um, uh, the, the bed. Um, in this particular case, you can see that the subject's um, shoulders are kind of hunched up a little bit and they're tensed. We want you kind of as relaxed as we possibly can, so we'll kind of wait to do this in between a contraction. Uh, but this maximum flexion allows us to place the epidural um, and this will fit between the spinous processes and uh, the sitting position is most frequently used. Now, if there is a placenta previa, we'll talk about later. If there's some other reasons medically why we don't want to sit you, um, we will do this with you laying on your side in a fetal position. It's, and it's a little bit more technically challenging, but we can do it. Uh, the epidural medication um, that we place will go through a small catheter, which is about the size of a piece of dental floss. This catheter is thread through a needle, and then the needle is removed, and the catheter is placed on your back, taped with a sterile dressing over it. Uh, the anesthesiologist or the CRNA will then program a pump which will deliver a basal rate or an infusion of local anesthetic medication. And then you'll be given a, a button that will allow you to press um, this reservoir to give yourself um, a bolus dose uh, when you would, would require it for breakthrough pain. Uh, so we usually will get you very comfortable at the, at the onset of the placement of an epidural. You'll take a giant power nap for about two or three hours. Uh, because the pain sensation will completely go away. And then as the pain returns a little bit, you'll be able to self-administer yourself and give yourself what we call PCEA, which is patient-controlled epidural analgesia. This commits you to bed rest. This will not permit you to get up and walk around um, the ward because you'll have some motor weakness uh, in your uh, quadriceps especially. Uh, so it's a, this commits you to bed rest. Uh, this is going to necessitate you remaining in place if you need to um, evacuate your bladder or um, to have a bowel movement. There'll be either a bedpan or a straight catheter would be placed uh, to empty your bladder.
So the question is, how late can you receive an epidural? Is it ever too late to, to receive one? Um, we can place an epidural any time up until 10 centimeters dilation when there's, there's crowning and you need to push. Uh, it's kind of a, a judgment call at that point in time. If I can keep you comfortable enough to sit um, uh, for a short period of time, I can place an epidural. Or if I can't do that, I can immediately place what we call a saddle block, which would anesthetize your perineum and allow you to have comfort with the delivery of the baby. So I can, I can rescue that situation even if this is a precipitous delivery and you come in. Uh, but there are some times where you come in and it's far too late and you're just, you know, you're just better pushing the baby out than you are trying to attempt to place an epidural at that late state. But I would say that on average, you know, the, the, the question is, is also raised, is it too early ever to have an epidural? Would an epidural placement in some way stall or delay uh, the progression of labor? And the answer to that question is vehemently no. I mean, it doesn't. Um, there have been multi-center studies that show that the placement of epidural analgesia at any period of time when you're in a routine pattern of labor, I mean, that means regular uh, two to three minutes, um, does not in any way reduce um, uh, uh, or it does in any way extend the length of time or the duration of, uh, of your labor. But in fact, we'll allow the, the, the mom to rest, let the baby's head engage uh, into the birth canal by relaxing musculature. Um, and the only thing that's ever been proven has been to um, uh, cause an, a necessity for forceps delivery uh, very late in the onset of stage uh, one labor. So if you're giving large amounts of local anesthetic medication at the very end of a labor, uh, it would tend to need a, a forceps delivery or something like, you know, um, a suction device. And we'll, we'll see some of that later on in the slides. Um, but good question because, um, you know, the current concerns are many, but, you know, you don't want to forestall your labor in any way. And certainly you don't want to uh, in some way harm the baby by giving a, a you know, a, a drug that's uh, so close to delivery also. Um, Anesthetics um, in and of themselves are safe. They don't cross the placenta uh, to in any way affect the baby. Uh, the only adverse effect from placing an epidural into um, the epidural space would be a transient drop in blood pressure that can occur sometimes. So the nurses are ready um, ahead of time by hydrating you with at least a liter or 1,500 mLs of fluid before we place an epidural. And also there are medications that are available to readily elevate your blood pressure in the event that um, we have a slight drop in blood pressure. The babies are monitored continuously with a fetal monitor from the time that you come in. So if you are um, receiving an epidural, we're watching fetal heart rate and watching your vital signs very carefully with the placement of an epidural. And then anytime we would either bolus dose it or we would redose the epidural, we would go through a ritual of taking vital signs for a period of time to make sure that uh, these, these effects were not uh, witnessed um, and we had you know, normal tension during this period of time. Um, uh, so we get to the benefits and the drawbacks. I mean, obviously placing a needle in your back is something that's gonna create some discomfort when we place it, so that's the, you know, the bad. Um, but the good is that you're gonna have adequate pain control and you're gonna be able to rest and um, you'll be able to rest for, or maybe even sleep during portions of your labor uh, and at least between contractions be very, very comfortable. Um, it's a low, relatively low risk procedure like we talked about. It's done under st sterile technique. It's well understood. There are standard practice here. So when one of the six anesthesiologists that, you know, comes to your, your aid uh, is placing an epidural, we have a standardized mixture of medications that we use. There's a standardized technique that we employ. So it's not like you're getting six different varieties of a different kind of procedure. So um, uh, I think that that's important because uh, we want one practitioner to be able to hand off to another. We want uh, to have standard infusions that the nurses are familiar with. And we want a consistent um, um, result from what we're doing. So we, we, we use the same type of you know, very low concentration local anesthetics, very slow, small doses of narcotic that are placed within that mixture to potentiate the effect, the analgesic effect of them. Uh, so the combination of the local anesthetics and the narcotics that we're giving by epidural infusion uh, will help uh, significantly reduce your pain. There can be some technical difficulty in placing one. If you've previously had um, a spinal deformity, if you have, say, severe idiopathic scoliosis, or you've had trauma, or, which required you know, skeletal fixation of your back, or there's obliteration of the epidural space because of a previous surgery, uh, these things can make the placement of an epidural uh, technically difficult and make the success of it somewhat um, questionable. 
Um, there can be side effects related to the placement. We talked about the hypotension or the reduction in blood pressure that can occur after its placement. There can be also some itching um, from the use of the intrathecal or epidural narcotics uh, that is very easily treated with either Benadryl or Nubain. Um, we don't advocate using uh, walking technique here because we talked about the, the quadriceps weakness that you might experience. Uh, due to the possibility of numbness or weakness in your legs, you're committed to bed rest. So if you don't want to be at bed rest and you want to get up and walk around a lot, an epidural is not what you, what you want in terms of pain control uh, at that point in time. Um, you'll need a urinary catheter or some way of emptying your bladder. Uh, that's just uh, because you lose the sensation of your bladder becoming distended. And a distended bladder is going to impair the ability of the baby's head to engage the birth canal, so the nurses will be checking the bladder um, and uh, make sure that it's empty um, at the time of delivery. You may experience some small tenderness at the site of the puncture site. Um, it should not hurt any more than an IV site. If you press on it, it will hurt, it will be sore. Uh, you might have a small bruise there for a short period of time, but uh, there should not be any long-lasting uh, back discomfort from the placement of an epidural. In fact, epidurals are used uh, oftentimes to place steroids within uh, the spinal uh, area uh, to ad administer medications uh, to alleviate back pain uh, themselves. So uh, the technique in and of itself is not something that should generate any long-term pain. Go ahead. Well, we use the nitrous up until the point that we would place the epidural, not during the placement of the epidural. And the nitrous oxide itself is very short-acting. And if you can recall your dental experience, you take it off yeah, and with about three or four or five deep breaths after you're, you know, you're off the nitrous, really the analgesic effect goes away. Uh, so it's very, very short limited. Uh, uh, you know, uh, but there, there may be other narcotics that are on board that you've received, IV. Uh, there may be other techniques that are employed to help you, um, you know, tolerate this. The pain from the placement of an epidural will be very limited. You'll feel no more than the local anesthetic medication being given on the skin. Uh, after that, that whole area that we've infiltrated should be numb, so the placement of the epidural needle should not be felt. Uh, sometimes you can feel <clears throat> some discomfort or pressure sensation. Uh, we want to know when you feel that, and that's why we don't anesthetize people while we place epidurals. Uh, we don't give them large amounts of drugs or sedatives. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's important that we get feedback from you, that you can tell us where you're feeling discomfort if you're feeling it while we're placing it. Okay? All right. So what prevents an epidural from being placed? Um, there are some medical conditions um, that otherwise would be a contraindication. Uh, any patient that has a bleeding disorder, <clears throat> clotting disorder, or on anticoagulants uh, might be uh, someone that we want to avoid uh, the placement of an epidural for. Uh, there are medical conditions within pregnancy, such as pregnancy-induced hypertension, which cause reduction in uh, the stickiness of your blood or the, or the platelets that are in your blood. Um, if your platelet count becomes critically low, we don't want to risk the placement of an epidural because that would also risk a hematoma in the area of the epidural space. So it's important that we know what your coagulation profile is before we place an epidural and, and uh, be assured that it's safe to place. Uh, certain uh, progressive neurologic disorders, difficult to discern whether or not you have adequate pain control or whether you have numbness or weakness due to the disorders themselves. So it's a relative contraindication of placing epidural um, pain control mechanisms uh, in those particular cases. And then any patient who's had prior instrumentation, back surgery, uh, where the epidural space itself might be obliterated, uh, it might prevent the adequate spread of local anesthetic within that epidural space because of the previous surgery and thereby uh, minimize its effectiveness. So any questions so far about the epidurals? Go ahead. So the question is, are there any patients that I've experienced in my own clinical, pra clinical practice that have had severe or bad, bad reactions to yeah, the placement of an epidural? The, the amount of the medications that we're using in the epidural space, we, we're basically placing micrograms of narcotics. So when we talk about a narcotic effect, we're not talking about the same type of effect that you normally would expect when you receive something IV or IM. So the blood levels that you're achieving are extremely low. The, and therefore the side effects from those blood levels, sedation, nausea, itching, constipation, all those other things are minimized by the, the mere fact that we're using such a low um, uh, amount of medication themselves. Um, with regard to the placement of an epidural in adverse reactions, um, if you were to receive an intravascular injection of a local anesthetic, if the medication would not go in the epidural space but would go partially into a blood vessel, 
um, you might feel ringing in your ears, you might experience um, a metallic taste in your mouth, you might even feel your heart race because we place epinephrine into the local anesthetic as a marker. So many patients have gone to the dentist's office and received a local anesthetic injection and said, wow, I had this injection and my, my heart just, just wanted to leap out of my chest and it beat really fast. Well, it wasn't the local anesthetic that was causing it. That was the, the epinephrine that was in the local anesthetic that was actually having the effect. So it's used as a safety mechanism. It's used as a marker to determine whether or not we are in the epidural space or we're actually near or in a blood vessel. So you can have side effects from during the placement of it, which would include heart racing, metallic taste, ringing in your ears. Um, we wouldn't proceed any further at that location if we were to determine that that was the effect, okay? That's probably the most serious adverse effect that you could have. If you've got a massive injection of local anesthetic, you could have a seizure. There are medications that we have and resuscitation equipment that's immediately available there. I mean, so in the event that all that medication went into the epidural you know, blood vessel but didn't go into the epidural space, we would be able to completely reverse that effect in a very short order. So I mean, that would be the worst case scenario. Um, but you know, we're, we're talking about one in you know, 10,000 cases that we you know, would administer an epidural that you would, you would have an intravascular injection of local anesthetic to that degree. Um, there are other issues that can complicate um, placement. If you have, like we said, a back deformity or technical difficulty in placing it, and you injure the dura or the covering which surrounds the cerebral spinal fluid or the CSF, we can create a leak of fluid that can occur after your labor is over with and your baby's delivered. And that can cause a postural headache uh, afterwards of what has been called years ago spinal headache. Um, lay flat in bed, the headache goes away, get up and try to care for the baby, the, the headache comes rip-roaring back. And it can be a rather severe headache. And that comes from the loss of CSF that, that occurs within the CSF space. Uh, the cerebral spinal fluid leaks out of the subarachnoid space and causes literally a dehydration of the area around our brain. And so the way to treat that is with the placement of what we call an epidural blood patch, where we would take med actually autologous blood from you under sterile technique and inject it into the epidural space to basically stop the, the leakage of CSF. Highly effective. 85% of patients get immediate relief of pain uh, with the placement of an epidural blood patch. And it, it's another procedure that has to be done, but it's only to treat the complication that would occur. Um, the incidence of uh, dural puncture or wet tap that we, we, we kind of describe this as is very limited in experienced hands. Uh, so I, I mean, I knock on wood, I mean, I haven't seen one in, you know, a few years, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that, you know, that potentially could happen. The key is to understand if it does happen, to recognize when it does, and to treat it, you know, effectively so you're comfortable afterwards, okay? What are the narcotics that are actually in it? We use a narcotic, we've agreed to use a narcotic called fentanyl, which is a very short-acting um, uh, narcotic that uh, we give uh, by continuous infusion. Uh, fentanyl is given in, like I said, it's very small micrograms, and it is in the infusion of the epidural pump that you self-administer into the epidural space. It's not placed in the IV for pain control. That's an opioid? It is an opioid, yes it is. And so the next question that flows from that is, is there any potential for addiction to either myself or my baby if I'm giving myself an opioid? The question is, you know, is a very valid one, especially with all the concerns that we have about the use of opioids. The answer to that question is no. And the reason is that we're using very minuscule amounts of medicines. You're receiving them for a very short period of time, and it's only for acute pain. Okay? Any other questions about epidurals? Go ahead, Susan. Yes, the, 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 the question was if, if you're getting coexisting narcotics at the same time, can you use um, an epidural with, that contains narcotics? And the answer to that question is yes. You don't have to wait. Um, you can receive all and within the hour um, get an epidural. Typically what, what your expectation should be is, uh, is that if you are going to plan an epidural um, in, your, in your labor plan, to inform your nurse of that uh, at the beginning of your labor or during a period of time where you've made that decision so that we can get an anesthesiologist to your bedside and perform an epidural within an hour. Uh, usually it will require us about 30 minutes to come in at nighttime but you'll get comfort within that half hour after we're here. So you can usually plan that if, I'm, if I want an epidural now, I'll be comfortable within about an hour. I'll have a practitioner at my bedside at least within the next 30 minutes to place an epidural, and uh, I can usually expect to be comfortable within about a 20 to 30 minute period after that. 
So stay all being given to someone at the time that they're requesting an epidural is not a concern. I mean, I, I think that that would be uh, something that we could use as a temporizing measure to actually create pain control before we arrived. So, so the question is, um, how long does the epidural take to wear off after the delivery of the baby? And that would depend upon the total number of milligrams that you're using in that short period of time before delivery. So if you're on the on pump and you're, you're pressing it frequently and you're getting a dose every 15 minutes uh, and the number of milligrams are going up, it could take upwards to two hours or three hours for, for everything to wear off. But it will wear off in that period of time. We use intermediate, intermediate acting local anesthetic medications. Uh, we, do, we don't use ultra short acting ones because we want you to get an effect from this uh, that it extends to, uh, for a period of time. So it's important for you to recognize that, you know, even if I'm numb now, 90 minutes from now to a couple hours from now, uh, this will begin to wear off. The nurses will check your motor response, make sure that you can bear weight, you can stand. You'll be shifted to a chair first. Um, they'll assist you with, with, uh, with movement from bed to chair. Uh, and make sure that you can ambulate uh, and that you have full recovery from the effects of the local anesthetic uh, before you could uh, stand and walk. Uh, but on average, I would say, you know, anywhere from about a two to three hour period of time after uh, your delivery would be in a normal range of time. No, the, the medications that we give, the molecular weights of these medications are so large that they don't cross the placenta and they don't create problems with blood levels within the baby that otherwise uh, would be problematic. Uh, so they're, they're, they're very safe medications and the only adverse effect that we talked that's really kind of related to the epidural would be reduction in utero placental blood flow because of maternal blood pressure dropping significantly after the placement of an epidural. So, uh, you know, that's why we're so cautious in making sure that, you know, that baby sees the same consistent blood flow, same blood pressure, same mean, mean arterial blood pressure that we want to see from the beginning of the time that we're actually um, uh, placing the epidural. Go ahead. So the question, as I understand it, is in, your impression is that in the 70s, the 80s, and early 90s that there was some bad rap related to epidurals. Um, I can tell you that we are using smaller and smaller concentrations of medications, and the advent of using narcotics to potentiate the effect of the local anesthetics has decreased the motor block that's occurred. Most women, I would say, were um, uh, affected by the use of higher concentrations of local anesthetics to relieve pain, but it caused more tremendous motor blocks, so they were more disturbed by the fact that they couldn't move, they couldn't push, they, you know. And so our, our philosophy, I think, over the past three decades has been to use less concentration of local anesthetic and use other adjuncts to kind of potentiate the effect, uh, the analgesic effect. And so thereby, we create a happier mom who can move quicker and you know, recover from the effect of the local anesthetic more readily. Yeah, the, the, the question is, is, is there a maximum length of time uh, that you can actually have an epidural placed? And the answer to that question is no. Um, I was on an acute pain service for you know, over 20 years and we placed epidurals for continuous infusion that you know, were up to three to five days after you know, procedures for surgery. So we feel very comfortable leaving indwelling epidural catheters in place because they're placed under sterile conditions they have sterile dressings that are placed on top of them so they can't be soiled. Amniotic fluid can't disturb the catheter if you have a bowel movement or whatever. Um, so we can leave them in for the duration of your, uh, your labor. If you get to about a 24 to 36 hour period of labor, we're usually kind of looking for other reasons why you're not delivering your baby. Um, is there a malposition? Is there um, too large a baby for a pelvic inlet? Um, you know, do we need to look at surgical delivery as an option? And we'll talk a little bit about how we can convert there by an epidural, which is existing, to a surgical anesthetic um, a little bit later. Okay? Any other questions before we get going? All right. Um, and, and, you know, this forum today that we're, we're discussing, um, this technique and, and your anesthesia uh, care, um, you know, it's a personal one. So if you feel like at any time you want to um, uh, look for an anesthesia consult or meet with an anesthesiologist prior to... Uh, your delivery, and you, know, you can simply talk to either your doctor or your midwife. They can arrange for us to have a 30-minute visit with you um, before we uh, proceed with um, your labor plan. And we can answer any personal questions you have about your own medical histories uh, and whether there's relative contraindications to using these techniques. Uh, so cesarean births. We talked um, a little bit earlier about the fact that about one of three of you in this room would undergo a surgical delivery. <laughs> 
Uh, that's basically playing the odds uh, that, it, that occurred nationally. When I was in my training, we were kind of in the 20 to 25 percent range, and people thought that was outrageous, that that was way too high. Now we're kind of approaching almost one in three. Uh, the reasons being, uh, they're very multifactorial. They deal with um, an aging population of women that are having babies. Um, they deal with some infertility treatments that are increasing the incidence of deliveries, uh, surgical deliveries. Uh, there are, are maternal illnesses that, are, that we're now seeing, such as gestational diabetes, leading to larger babies. Uh, we're seeing pregnancy-induced hypertension at greater rates. So all these things compel your practitioner to, to put into dialogue a consideration for the, for the delivery under a surgical um, a technique. Um, so a surgical delivery or cesarean delivery is simply a baby being uh, delivered through an incision that's made in the abdomen and the uterus. It's performed if a vaginal birth is not possible or, or safe for either the mom or the baby. Uh, and we'll talk about what some of those reasons are. Um, some of them are planned, uh, some of them are unplanned or uh, non-emergent, and then some of those are emergent. So the reasons for a planned cesarean delivery would be if you have a malposition. If the baby is coming in a breech presentation where the feet are coming before uh, the rest of the baby, uh, or a transverse lie where the baby is basically coming on its side, and it's not coming either by um, uh, head or by feet. Uh, placenta previa would be a condition where the placenta itself would precede the delivery of the baby. Uh, that is not um, uh, all that times, if it's a complete previa, not a very safe thing. Uh, sometimes there can be a partial placenta previa. Uh, and then there can be some debate as to whether or not it's reasonable to proceed with delivery surgically or by um, uh, uh, vaginal delivery. Mom can have multiples. Um, twins may be born vaginally, uh, and there is about a 15% to 20% incidence of a necessity to deliver the second twin surgically. Uh, that's kind of national averages. So that's not a, a guarantee that if you deliver the first, you're going to deliver the second. My daughter just had triplet girls, and she delivered all of these by cesarean section. So. Uh, safer for her, safer for the babies, um, and then you have a control situation where you have multiple pr practitioners in the room. Uh, you can <clears throat> schedule this at a particular time to have three neonatologists and you know three isolates, and you know, uh, so er everything is a in a very ordered kind of plan and structured way when you have multiples, and uh, this improves the safety of the delivery. Uh, there can be medical conditions in the mom or in the baby that um, uh, cause us to have a planned delivery. One of those might be if the baby has a deformity of its uh, spinal canal, uh, like a spina bifida, or if there is a condition within the child where we don't want to risk of the, the physical nature of a vaginal delivery, uh, so the baby would be born uh, surgically. Uh, or a medical condition in the mom, such as, say, <clears throat> very um, high blood pressure due to pregnancy-induced hypertension that might necessitate you know, uh, consideration for cesarean delivery. And um, the issue uh, regarding previous cesarean delivery, um, there is uh, some variable thought uh, with regard to offering mothers after they've had a single cesarean delivery to plan a repeat. Uh, and that would depend upon the causes or the, or the factors that were involved. This would be a discussion you would have with your OB <clears throat> with regard to that. So um, what are some of the reasons for a, an unplanned uh, C-section delivery? Well, <clears throat> labor itself may be prolonged and not progressing adequately. Your uterus may not be contracting with adequate force despite medication that's being given to augment it or to improve the contractility. There can be fetal distress. Um, <clears throat> baby's heart may, may, may drop because of um, a compression of the cord or because of the position that the baby's in that is compressing the cord or maybe uh, an issue with a uterine placental blood flow from the placenta to the cord itself. So um, baby may move into a position that is no longer cephalic. Uh, they could start out cephalic and maybe move transverse uh, or into you know, a breech position, uh, which makes it either difficult or impossible to deliver. Or you can have a very small pelvic inlet and you can have a very large baby, which we call subtle pelvic disproportion or CPD. Uh, this in and of itself can uh, necessitate uh, the, the reasons for delivery uh, surgically. Go ahead. You'll, knew that, you'll know that by your ultrasound, uh, you know, what position the baby is in, and then by the physical examination of your, your OB, who will be able to determine whether you're in a head down or a head up position. That'll be the day of or 
And, and if there's any question, they'll do an ultrasound to make sure that you know, they, they're in a cephalic position. So those, those things are, are, are known before we proceed with labor. So reasons for emergent cesarean section, and I'm not listing these because I want to frighten you, or you know, these happen less than 1% of all deliveries. Uh, there can be a cord prolapse where basically the cord comes down before the baby is delivered. Uh, if that were to occur, uh, the nurse who is caring for you or your midwife would put a gentle hand up into the, va uh, the vaginal canal and hold the cord in position to stabilize it and not to allow it to compress and make sure that you could feel a pulsating cord. And then we would go back gently to the operating room and do a cesarean delivery with her hand continually there until the baby was delivered. There is a placental abruption that can occur where the placenta itself um, abrupts or basically comes off the uterine wall so that the uterus is no longer supplying blood supply to the placenta or is creating a hematoma within uh, the uterus itself. Um, placental abruptions are a gynecologic emergency. You have to go back and, and, and deliver surgically immediately. Uterine rupture can occur, but this rarely if ever happens in, in, in primip primiparous uh, women, uh, women that are having their first babies. This is usually something that is seen with the thinning of the uterus over many, many surgical deliveries. So if you have, say, four or five cesarean deliveries, the likelihood of something like this gets greater and greater. So uterine rupture is a potential and one that we, we monitor for uh, continually in, in that population. Any patient that is a VBAC or is having a surgical delivery after a cesarean section here requires to have an anesthesiologist in-house at all times. So we have emergency anesthesia personnel that are in, uh, in the hospital ready to deal with any situation like a uterine rupture. Go ahead. No, you, we come to you, but you're moved to an operating room suite, which is on the same floor that you're on in, in the other wing of the suite. So you're literally about, what, Susan, 50 to 100 feet away from the average delivery room, uh, where you'd be moved to a surgical suite uh, where we would come to you immediately. So you don't have to go anywhere or trans, be transferred anywhere. Now, the exception to that rule would be if there's an ongoing cesarean section in the suite itself at that time, and there was an emergency delivery, we would take you to the operating room. We also reserve an operating room in the hospital here to make sure that if there's a cesarean section going, we make sure that an operating room is available so that we can actually bring somebody down in the, in the event of an emergency delivery. Okay? All right. I hope that provides you a little bit of comfort. Provides me comfort, anyway. Um, and any form of severe fetal distress requires an emergency sex, uh, section. So this uh, essentially is your labor suite. Uh, where you'll come in, that's the uh, admission desk, um, and this is a, what a typical delivery room would look like. Um, the beds have stirrups that come out at the bottom of them. Uh, you can deliver in a, in a lithotomy position with your legs up. Uh, there's a, rag, uh, there's a, uh, a row of monitors that are on uh, the left-hand side of the bed here, which include the uh, fetal monitor and some non-invasive blood pressure recording device, and then an oximeter and an EKG that's available. Uh, we monitor your, your fetal heart rate strips and your pattern of labor, your contraction uh, in the room and then also the nurses will be monitoring this throughout the suite. So at the nurse's station and also throughout the unit, we can look up and look at the monitors and see what your pattern of labor is, what's going on with your baby, what your vital signs are. So even though your nurse is not in your room or your, doc your doctor's not in your room, we're monitoring you continuously. Uh, this is a patient that volunteered uh, who is a repeat C-section to come in and demonstrate what the average experience would be if you uh, were to have a cesarean delivery. Um, she's meeting Dr. London, who is one of our former anesthesiologists here, and she's give, giving co informed consent. He's, he meets with the patient, discusses um, the medical conditions that have occurred throughout the pregnancy, uh, assesses the airway, listens to the heart and lungs, and then uh, uh, proceeds with his description of what his anesthetic would be at the time. The beauty of this class for all of you is that when I meet you at 2 o'clock in the morning and you're uncomfortable, um, we've already had this conversation, all right, and a very thorough conversation. So most of you are, are very well-informed patients uh, and don't, you know, require a large amount of conversation or education when you're in the process of having um, uh, cyclic con contractions, which are very uncomfortable. Everybody that has either an epidural or has a C-section is, is placed uh, an IV catheter so that we can administer medications and IV fluids to you. 
Um, this patient's receiving what we call sodium citrate, which is a non-particulate antacid, which is given to neutralize the acid in your stomach. All of you uh, in this room have resting gastric volumes that are higher. You have more acidic um, gastric juice because of your pregnancy and because of the hormonal changes in your body. Um, you're more apt to have full stomachs uh, when you proceed to labor or need surgery, so uh, using this antacid is a, a safety mechanism for us. Um, you're taken back to the operating suite by your circulating nurse. Dad is put in a bunny suit um, and gets ready to come back. This is where the operating room suite is on the same floor that you'll be delivering at. There's one operating room that's back there to your right. Uh, why this patient's walk into the operating room with their own Foley catheter, I don't know, because we normally don't put Foley catheters in patients prior to them going to the operating room, but, you know, it, it's, it's done, I guess, for dramatic purpose. Um, patient has an IV that's in place. The nurse is walking the patient back to the OR. Um, we say our goodbyes. This is the operating room suite. You'll see the anesthesia machine that's in the center of the room. Um, uh, the operating table to the left. There are personnel that will be counting instruments and making sure that uh, there's a uh, sterile um, technique that is, uh, is being observed. We'll place you on the operating table in a sitting position. There's a nurse that's dedicated to taking care of the baby when the baby's delivered, so there's an isolate. There may be a pediatrician in the room also if it's a scheduled surgical delivery. So we'll have someone there to just solely resuscitate baby, so there'll be a nurse and there'll be a pediatrician that's there. Uh, my role is to manage your care, to take care of you, your vital signs, and your comfort. Vital monitors are put on here, EKG leads, um, blood pressure cuff, people getting ready. This is a, a typical spinal kit that, that, that Dr. London's opened up. We put you in that hunch position, that sitting position here. Your back is prepped and draped with the use of um, a antiseptic, and then uh, medications are drawn up. We place a skin wheel into the skin to anesthetize the area. We place an introducer then into this area that is already anesthetized. The patient is not experiencing pain at this point in time. Uh, a second needle is placed through this area uh, of introduction and there isn't, isn't any pain or discomfort from the placement of this either. Um, occasionally you can feel some pressure. You might feel uh, a little discomfort when we're actually placing the introducer, uh, but the, the medication is now being injected into the cerebral spinal fluid. What you're witnessing right here is not an epidural, but this is a spinal anesthetic that we're using for an elective cesarean delivery. The patient is placed in a supine position and laid on the operating table. These medications are weighted. Uh, they have a specific gravity that's heavier than uh, the cerebral spinal fluid. So they will actually drop down with gravity. We can control the level of the patient's block by the movement of the operating table and moving that medication up and down before it actually has its uh, clinical effect. So positioning on the operating table is critical, the angle of which we place you down. Um, Dr. London is moving the operating table at this point in time to put the patient in, in the position that he desires. We will prep and drape your abdomen at this point in time, uh, make sure that you're comfortable. Uh, that you have an adequate level of anesthesia. I usually will use an alcohol wipe and monitor temperature sensation because temperature and pain travel by the same pathway. Uh, if we were to sense cold um, at, at a very low level, we'd know that we don't have a surgical level of anesthesia. But typically what our desire is to get about a T6 level, which is about the bottom of your breastbone, about where your xiphoid process is, right about here. And so that's important so that when we're doing your surgical delivery, you feel no discomfort from either retraction or delivery of the baby. Um, there'll be uh, manipulation of the child that you might feel during the procedure, pushing, pulling, tugging. A second assistant may press down at the upper portion of your abdomen. Uh, to try to drive the baby's head and shoulders out. Um, at that point in time, the pressure goes away within about two or three seconds. Uh, you might even get some acid backwash in your mouth or become nauseated for a short period of time right when that happens. We're prepped and draped and ready to go. A small fan and steel incision is made in the lower portion of your abdomen. This is a, uh, some people call it bikini uh, because it resembles the, the, the line across the top of a bikini. Um, mom is perfectly comfortable at this point in time. She's talking to her husband. Um, she's wearing some supplemental oxygen. Uh, we're giving no sedation at this point. She's awake and alert. Um, baby is not out yet. This uh, rather crude looking device is, uh, is a suction um, uh, that we use to place gently on the crown of the baby so that we can guide the baby's head out. Um, you, can, you can remember the babies are in amniotic fluid. They're slippery, sometimes difficult to get a hold of. 
Um, so we place this device, this pump is sometimes placed to um, gently move the baby's head and shoulders out um, of the abdomen. The baby is delivered um, and dried uh, and uh, vital signs are taken. Uh, some supplemental oxygen may be delivered at this time. Remember that if we do a cesarean delivery electively and the baby has not had any, any vaginal delivery attempt, we haven't expressed any of the, the fluid from the lungs. The baby requires a period of time to kind of, you know, get kick-started and, 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 and express this fluid, be suctioned vigorously um, and stimulated. Uh, and so that is occurring in the isolate right now. Uh, you may, be, may hear the baby cry immediately, but, you know, sometimes there's that five or ten seconds that occurs in between. That can be the longest five or ten seconds for moms when babies come out. Uh, but we'll reassure you and tell you that, you know, all is well. Um, the cord is uh, basically clamped there with an instrument. Sometimes dads will cut the cord themselves over in the isolate. That's a typical umbilical cord. That's kind of the, re the end result, which is a, a, a plastics closure of a fan and steel incision. Um, sometimes they'll place steri strips or wound glue on, the, on this to get a better cosmetic um, result. Um, this is when the bonding begins. Uh, we try to do something called skin to skin as much as we possibly can right now, uh, which means that we clear our monitors out. We let moms um, basically bond with baby and maybe even make attempts at first um, breastfeeding on your chest while your abdomen is being closed for your cesarean section. So we try to do this as quickly as we can. Uh, this is important because it is um, uh, good for your baby in terms of its ability to bond with you and to start to um, make attempts at breastfeeding, but also it, it creates a hormonal release in your own body of oxytocin and uh, other things, prolactin, other hormones that will actually be favorable for breastfeeding and allow you to uh, have better uterine contraction. Uh, so um, we tried doing skin to skin, the baby's doing well. Um, and temperature's okay, there's no severe prematurity or any breathing issues. Uh, the nurses will tell you um, uh, that it's okay for us to do this. They'll ask me if it's, it's all right, and you know, nine times out of 10, we say yes. And I've just shown a few of these family photos. Once we're completed with the operation, you move from the operating table to your bed and take it back to your, the same labor room that you um, originally were in, where you can have a little bit more privacy. The average length of time for a primary C-section should be somewhere between you know, 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, so a baby is usually out within about the first 10 minutes of the procedure, so the remainder of the procedure is surgical closure of the uterus and then closure of the abdomen. Um, and it gives everybody a period of time to you know, uh, get baby straight, get some bonding going, and um, it's a very enjoyable hour for most people. Baby's weighed, we all take uh, bets as to kind of who's gonna be nearest to the ounce. I'm usually always way off. Sometimes they're bathed right away. Siblings get to know each other. So, uh, any questions about that experience so far uh, for cesarean delivery? No, it is, actually. Yeah, we wait. We, we actually time it by the clock to delay the cord clamp, even surgically. So uh, when baby comes out, I mean, unless there's real fetal distress, I mean, there's some reason to cut the cord and get going. Um, you know, if there's some problem with the cord, we're not gonna wait for the cord to empty into the baby. But, you know, if we're having, an, you know, a surgical delivery because of elective reasons, such as maybe baby's too big for pelvic inlet or something like that, I mean, we will literally sit there and count on the clock 45 seconds or a minute and make sure that we, you know, we use that time for uh, cord filling. So, so that's the, just as we do a vaginal delivery, we try to kind of bring those things into the realm of the surgical delivery too. So, I mean, a lot of these things have changed over the past three decades. I mean, none of this was even a consideration, you know, when I started training. But, you know, now we're kind of, you know, learning that these things have significant benefit to, mom, to baby and to mom. So, um, so for a C-section, we just went over a spinal anesthetic for a C-section. Your epidural can be used for surgical delivery in the event that your labor doesn't progress uh, in, the, in the desired manner that we want it to and you need a surgical delivery. We just convert the local anesthetics that we're using in the infusion to much higher concentrations that we're gonna use for surgery. Uh, so that would just mean we take the infusion tubing away, we start to administer local anesthetic through the existing epidural catheter and we would achieve um, a surgical delivery by moving the volume of medication uh, to a point where we um, get about a T6 level of, of anesthesia. Now that being said, there are more milligrams that are necessary 
to achieve anesthesia with epidural, uh, surgical epidural. And for that reason, you might experience more side effects like shaking or shivering or tremulousness uh, from the effects of the local anesthetic. Uh, most OB nurses would say most definitely their ex experiences, if you see a patient coming from the operating room, they could usually tell who's had a spinal anesthetic and who's had an epidural uh, for their C-section based on uh, their appearance. So we can use a spinal. Um, if an epidural is, is failing or is not adequate, I would not nurse it. I would take it out and I would place a spinal anesthetic for um, your surgical delivery. And it's a simple procedure that takes me, you know, three to five minutes. The third option would be general anesthesia. If you don't have an existing epidural that's in place and there's fetal distress, that means that we go back to the operating room immediately and we go to sleep. And we use drugs that, we, you know, are safe for baby, but some of those medications are going to cross the placenta in the period of time it takes to get you induced and get the baby out. Uh, that period of time usually is at about three, three minutes to five minutes from the time that we say we got to go back to the time that we usually have baby you know, on the table and out. It's safe to be sedated after um, your baby is out. So if you look up at me and say, you know, I'm not really one of those people that likes to hear a lot of medical conversation or really kind of participate in all this, I'm getting a little anxious. Uh, is there something you can give me? Absolutely. If that's what you want, I can provide those things to you. If you don't want to do skin to skin, there's no harm. Um, sometimes you may need to wait several hours um, if you've had a full stomach and this is an elective uh, cesarean delivery. Uh, so normally if you're planning to come in for a C-section or a repeat C-section, we'll make you fast overnight. So you are at least got about an eight hour period of time before surgery. Uh, if it's an emergency, we don't wait. We just go straight ahead and, uh, and, and you know, we do what's called protection of your airway with what we call cricoid pressure. We, we will induce anesthesia with a second practitioner at your neck, just basically preventing you from refluxing while you go off to sleep. For scheduled C-section, uh, like we said, you need to fast overnight. For post-op pain control, we will mix uh, sustained release morphine into the epidural mixture or into the intrathecal mixture, the medicines that we put into the CSF. Like once again, we're giving these medications in very, very small amounts, but because they're administered neuroaxially, they have a very profound effect and can last upwards to 24 hours after the procedure is over with. The great benefit of this is we can minimize the overall amount of narcotic requirement that you have afterwards and thereby decrease the amount of narcotic that the baby's exposed to, especially if you're breastfeeding. Most narcotics that you take either orally, you're gonna take IV or give an IM, or gonna concentrate in breast milk and thereby be transferred to the baby ultimately. Now, the baby has the same enzyme systems that you have in your, in your liver that break these things down, uh, but you know, we don't wanna give narcotics and sedatives to babies if we don't have to. So um, there's a thoughtfulness about this, and sometimes if we're in a mode where we need an IV narcotics, uh, we'll use them, certainly to relieve pain. Um, intravenous oral pain medications can also be used, like we talked about, and you'll be monitored um, as you recover in your labor room we use pain score techniques, you know, what's your pain from zero to 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever had, zero being no pain. I mean, some people are very good with scores, some people don't know how to do the arithmetic. You know, some people have, you know, pain scores that go, you know, eight, nine, 10, you know. Um, and, and, and others, you know, are, are perly, perfectly happy telling you, you know, it's moderate, severe, you know. If you're in a moderately severe state, we want to address that pain control. We want you to enjoy and the time that you're spending with your baby and bond, so that's, that's an imperative for us, okay? So what can you expect when you receive um, care from your anesthesia team here? We do, we practice anesthesia in a team approach, which means that we have both anesthesiologists and CRNAs. Our anesthesiologists all are very adept at doing um, neuroaxial blocks and, and providing epidural analgesia. Uh, there are two or three of our CRNAs that are, that will also at times come up and place epidurals and be there for your care. Um, that care is provided under the supervision of an anesthesiologist always. We have to live within a 30 minute period of time at the hospital, so if I'm on call and I get the call from Susan in the middle of the night, hey, we need you, I'll be at your bedside within 30 minutes. We'll usually have an epidural place within about another 10 minutes and you'll be comfortable within the hour, okay? All your anesthetic methods require some form of recovery, so this is not gonna be something like when we flip a light switch and you know, you're up and walking around and taking care of your baby immediately. Um, and sometimes you'll be able to choose your anesthesia provider. If you've had a successful experience in the past, you had a C-section with me or someone else, one of my partners, you can certainly uh, work with your OB to uh, choose that provider, but you know, 
That's not a guarantee in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock when I'm on call. Four anesthesia is comprised of six anesthesiologists, and now we're down to, I think, four uh, CRNAs. All members have uh, experience in obstetrical anesthesia. Well, you've been a very attentive audience. Thank you very much. Great questions tonight. Thank you. Good luck.